Hello and welcome to this God Day, where I am going to give you an overview of Leviticus. Now, I feel like I gave myself a big task when preparing for this because I hadn't really heard much about Leviticus prior to about two weeks ago, where it came to my attention for a particular scripture that we were using on a particular program. And I'd never really understood Leviticus in its context or what it was about. I'd heard in the past that it was instructions for priests back in the biblical times, and that is partly true. There is parts of Leviticus that talk about that, but that's not what the whole book is about. So today I'm just going to give you, like I say, an overview because this God day might actually end up giving you more questions than it does answers. But that's okay because the point of this God day is kind of to whet your appetite a little bit, to get you interested and engaged, to wanting to read and study Leviticus for yourself. It is a hard going book. There is a lot of instructions in there for Israelites at a particular time. And we are going to talk about that in context in a moment. But I want to encourage you, it is one of the books of the Bible, so it must have been important. It's important to understand what it is that God was saying to them people at that time, but also how it can be applicable to us today. So I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible. I'm just laying the foundations to understand and summarize the book of Leviticus so that you can go and study yourself. And like I say, even when you read it, you might have more questions that pop up. I know I certainly did. And that's when you need to spend time speaking to someone, maybe your pastor or someone who knows the Bible well, to get answers to your questions and of course pray about it as well. So Leviticus, let's understand the context of the book. It comes straight after Exodus and we know that in Exodus this is when Moses led the Israelites out of slavery, out of captivity from Egypt. So now they are wandering in the wilderness as God leads them to the promised land. So this is where Leviticus is taking place. They are also camping at the bottom of Mount Sinai where Moses had gone up to get the Ten Commandments and brought them down. But we do know that the Ten Commandments was brought down and as Moses came down, already the Israelites were worshipping another god. They had built a golden calf who they were worshipping and they were complaining about the god who has just freed them from slavery. So already we see they've gone against God, they've sinned against God and they've disobeyed him and turned their back on him to start worshipping another God. So this is important to understand. This is where Leviticus is starting, that they are sinful people that have gone against God. But God loves each and every one of us unconditionally and he still loved them people just as much back then. So he wanted to find a way for him to still live in their presence he was in a, uh, his God's presence was in a tab tabernacle, which is kind of like a little tent that Moses was uh, able to go and speak to God through. But at this moment in time, no one could enter that tabernacle because of the sin, because of the uncleanliness, which we'll get to later. Because God is so holy that sin can't enter his presence. The surroundings of God is so holy that sin can't enter that. Corruption can't enter that. Disobedience can't enter that. So instead of destroying the people for being sinful, out of God's grace, he made a way to make them holy again. And this is what the whole book of Leviticus is about, is, is rituals and different instructions of how to become holy so that God can live with them and his presence can live in the midst of them. So the purpose of the book is about how they can become reconciled back to God, to be able to live with God among them again and to become holy. And holy means to be set apart. And we will see in uh, a bit further on into this devotional how actually God was trying to set them apart from other pagan religions, from other pagan worship. They had just come out of Egypt full of worship of false idols, false gods, rituals that were against God. And where God was leading them into, into the promised land, they would have to come across the Canaanites who also were practicing pagan uh, rituals and religion. So God wanted to make them holy, not only so his presence can be with them, but so that they were set apart from other religions, other pagan practices, and were the ones following the one true God. And it says in Leviticus 19, verses 1 to 2, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. So we can see here that this is the foundation of Leviticus, that God is holy and he wants his people to be set apart from everybody else and to be holy like he is. 
And it's God's grace that is providing this way for sinful human beings to be able to come to him and to live in his presence. God's holiness is pure and powerful and it destroys any corruption or sin that may come near it. So the structure of Leviticus is kind of three sections that is split up into and it's symmetrical. In the middle of it, you've got a festival called the Day of Atonement. And then either side of it, you've got three different things that the, uh, that the book is split up into. The first few sections or, or that we read is rituals to be practiced and also instructions for sacrifices. And we're gonna go into a bit more detail of understanding what the sacrifices meant and their importance and how they were done. But the first few books is about the rituals that they needed to perform in order to become holy and the sacrifices and the instructions for those. Then the role of the priesthood is uh, in there. As I mentioned earlier, I thought the whole of Leviticus was just about instructions for the priests. But there are certain sections of Leviticus that talk about that, of who the priests are, what they need to do in order to become clean and the importance of their role as well. And then you've also got purity laws for the Israelites, for the people that Moses was leading, that God was speaking through Moses to the Israelites in the wilderness of some purity laws for many different reasons, which again, we're going to come to of the way that they should be living to be God's holy people. And then, as I mentioned, the middle section is about the Day of Atonement, which we will explain shortly as well. So let's start off with the sacrifices. One of the rituals that God commanded the Israelites to do are sacrifices. Now, there was two reasons to why people would be sacrificing at this time. To say thank you for what God has provided for them or to say sorry for what they had done against God. So the sacrifices of thanks were to give something back to God that he had already provided and given them. For example, grain. Obviously, God created the world and he created all the nature that's in it. But we are able to use grain for, for baking and for sowing of seeds and all sorts of things. So when we are thanking God or when the Israelites were sacrificing to thank God for what he has done in their lives, then they would offer him up grain. However, if they had done something wrong, if they had been sinful and they wanted to confess and come to God in repentance, then they were called to sacrifice animals. Now, the wages of sin is death, as it says in Romans 6, 23. But God doesn't want to destroy them. Like I mentioned earlier, it's God's grace that loves them. So even though the Israelites have sinned and the wages of death is sin, God doesn't want to destroy them. God doesn't want to take their own lives. So therefore, they take the life of an animal. The animal symbolically dies in their place and atones for them. And atones means that their sin is covered by the blood of the animal. The blood represents the innocent life that is given in place of the guilty person making the offering. Does that sound familiar to us as Christians today? We know that Jesus's innocent blood was shed to cover our sins. We are the guilty ones. We are the ones that deserve death. We are the ones that were sinful. Yet Jesus is the one that paid the price for us. He sacrificed his life for us, just like back in these days, before this was way before Jesus came. And therefore they used animals as sacrifices. And we know that we don't need to do that anymore because we have Jesus as our ultimate sacrifice. So that's why in our modern age, since the New Testament and the New Covenant, since Jesus died and resurrected and covered us with his righteousness and his blood, we no longer need to do that for ourselves because as Christians, we can accept his sacrifice. So that's an important thing for us to remember that this is written back way in the Old Testament, right near the beginning before Jesus comes. So that's how we can distinguish that we in our modern day do not need to sacrifice animals anymore, but understand the importance of why Jesus died and he sacrificed his life. Now, it's interesting that in Leviticus, it talks about how life is in the blood of the animal. In Leviticus 17, 10 to 11, it says, I will set my face against any Israelite or foreigner residing among those who eats blood, and I will cut them off from the people. For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And then Leviticus 17, 14 emphasizes this by saying, the life of every creature is in its blood. 
Therefore, that is why they would sacrifice the animal and pour out the blood because that was the life that was taking, that was being sacrificed instead of their life. Because of their sinful ways, the wages of death is sin. So because they sinned, the wages is death. But instead of them taking their lives, they took the lives of the animal, symbolically atoning for their sins and covering it. But like I mentioned, we do not need to do that anymore because Jesus poured out his blood for us, which means he poured out his life for us so that we don't need to sacrifice an animal anymore. Jesus was our ultimate sacrifice so that we can receive forgiveness, grace, mercy, love and reconciliation from God our Father. But it's interesting how Jesus was very radical back in his day. He was teaching things that shocked the people. And we see that specifically in Matthew 28, verses 27 to 28, when he said, Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of the forgiveness of sins. Now, those who would have taken Jesus' word literally would have been horrified at what he just said. He's saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. So they thought he was saying physically to drink his blood. And that would have been outrageous because many of the pagan practices and the rituals of worshipping false idols would have physically drank blood. And... It was often done in hopes that they would take on the characteristics of that animal, for example, strength or speed or whatever it is of that animal that they wanted. So they would drink its blood, believing they would receive that. And Jesus wasn't physically saying to drink his blood. The wine was symbolic of the fact that he would be pouring out his blood for us on the cross, that he would be giving his life up for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. And he wants us to identify with him. He was asking his believers to identify with who he was, not about the, the other false gods, not about trying to take characteristics of the animal, but realise how important that Jesus is the Son of God, that God sent his one and only Son to die for us because he loves us unconditionally so that we can be reconciled with him. And that's why we don't need to live by these laws necessarily anymore. We're going to go on in a, in a bit to some purity laws and to some moral laws that God gave the Israelites at the time. And we don't necessarily have to follow each and every one of these anymore because we know that Jesus came to die for us. And therefore, we don't need to make ourselves clean because Jesus died to make us clean. He cleanses us and he purifies us with his blood that has been sacrificed for us. But many of these laws are still beneficial for us. We don't have to, we're not condemned to do them by law's sake, but they're still beneficial for us. They're still a blessing to us to love one another and treat one another right and to make us holy. Because remember, that's the whole point of the book of Leviticus is to try and encourage God's people how to be holy. And we are still called to do that today. So before I move on to the purity laws, there were some other rituals as well as the sacrifice that were encouraged or, or God wanted the Israelites to follow on a yearly basis. And these were seven annual feasts, some of them you may recognise. And they reminded them of how God redeemed them from Egypt. So we have Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, feast of weeks, feast of trumpets, the day of atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and it also states the weekly Sabbath, the seventh day of rest and sacred assembly, which we know as Christians, we do on a weekly basis as well. And I'm not going to go into what all them feasts are because that can be a completely got different God day in itself. But they're important to know that God gave these for the Jewish people to follow. And many modern Jewish people still follow these today to remember and praise God for what he did, for giving them freedom from Egypt and leading them into the promised land. So as I mentioned, part of the Leviticus is about the law of the priests. Now, Aaron and his family were ordained as priests. And we know, if we have read the book of Exodus, that Aaron was a helper of Moses. He was alongside Moses, being with him, being his speaker, doing miracles for God. And he helped through God and through the power of the Holy Spirit to release uh, the Israelites from Egypt. So Aaron had a key role in all of this. And it was Aaron and his family who were ordained as priests, which set a precedent for the future forever. 
that all future priests that were ordained must come from the family of Aaron. They must be descendants of his. And when they were ordained, it meant that they could go into the presence of God and present the sacrifices to, to God on behalf of the people. So the role of the priest was to be a representation of the people to God, but also to be a representation of God to the people. They were kind of like the middleman, if you like. And therefore, they had a higher level of integrity and moral living to live up to. They had a higher standard because they were the ones that were coming into the presence of God. And as I mentioned, sin and corruption cannot come into the presence of God without being destroyed. And therefore, they needed to be holy and they needed to be cleansed before they came into the presence of God. And the role of the priest was to stand in the gap between the people and God. That's what Jesus stated and that's what Jesus is, sorry, for us. We know that he came to stand in the gap between God and us as sinful people. And that's why in Hebrews 4.14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. So Jesus is now our high priest. As Christians, we do not need to go to another person to be able to come into the presence of God. Even though we are sinful human beings, we are covered in Jesus's blood and righteousness, which purifies us from our sins when we repent and confess. And therefore, we do not need to go through someone else to do that because we go through Jesus who died on the cross for us to do that. So that's the role of a priest. And again, that's in two sections of Leviticus of, of what a priest is, the importance of it, and also the qualifications and the standard of living that they have. So that's in Leviticus as well. But I think the main part that kind of relates to us today, because you might be thinking, Nikki, how does any of this relate to us? We're not priests. We don't have to sacrifice anymore. So how is Leviticus relevant to us today? Well, I think the purity laws and the moral laws that are stated in Leviticus are still applicable to us today for our benefit and for our blessing. So the purity laws, like I mentioned, because God is holy, the people needed to be in a state of holiness or purity to come into his presence. And this was known as being clean. If they were not in a holy state, they could not come into his presence and they would be known as impure or unclean. And there were certain things that they did or certain things that they touched or certain things that they ate or activities that they did, which would make them unclean. And in order to become clean again, there would be some things that we'd need to do. Maybe it would just be a set period of time. Sometimes it says, and by the evening, they'll be clean. Maybe they would have to sacrifice to become clean. Maybe they would need to physically wash as well to become spiritually clean in that aspect. So some things that you could become unclean by doing is touching bodily fluid, having a skin disease, touching mold or a dead body, eating an impure animal, which is listed in Leviticus. And these are the things that the Israelites related to death. And this would contaminate them and make them unclean because it is opposed to what God stands for. God, God and his holiness brings life. So if the Israelites were to touch something that was related to death, that would contaminate them and it would make them unholy because God's holiness brings life. And therefore they needed to do something to make themselves holy again in order to come into God's presence. Now being unclean wasn't a sin as such. It was just a temporary state that they found themselves in. And like I said, they could go from being unclean to clean, depending on what it is that was required of them, which is stated in Leviticus. It's, it's very repetitive. When I found that I was, I listened to Leviticus on my mobile phone app, and it sounds like it's very repetitive. But we know in the Bible, when something is repetitive, God is really emphasizing the importance of that thing. And because these were instructions for the Israelites at the time, they needed to be clear and know what it was that God was instructing them to do. Um, sometimes as well, if they were unclean, they would have to have a period of isolation. If uh, a woman was on her period for such, or if they had a skin disease, especially with the skin diseases, they had to go and have a period of isolation so that it wouldn't spread to the other Israelites. So some of these instructions and laws are for health reasons as well. God loves us and he doesn't want all of us to get ill if one person has got that disease. So out of, uh, out of looking after one another as well, they would be isolated and separated until they were better. So 
As I mentioned right at the beginning of this God day, God gave them these laws, these moral laws, so that they would not follow in the footsteps of the Egyptians. They just spent however many years in captivity in Egypt. They would have seen the mindset of the Egyptians. They would have seen the worship of the false idols and the rituals that the Egyptians did. And God wanted to get that out of their minds and say, this is how you become my people again, who I created you to be. And where they were going, like I mentioned, they would have to face the Canaanites who also practiced these pagan rituals. So God wanted them to be 100% sure on who they were and that they were holy and to follow God's ways before they came up with the temptation potentially of following in the ways of the Canaanites. Both cultures were infested with idol worship and false gods and worldly sinful desires. And the Israelites needed to be pure and set apart for God's glory. Now, like I say, right in the middle of all this is the Day of Atonement, which today is also known as Yom Kippur. And it is a yearly feast that the, Israel, uh, that the Jewish people celebrate. And it's one of the holiest days of the Jewish year. And basically, the idea is that the high priest would take two goats. One would be a purification offering to atone for the sins of the people. And its blood would be sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the middle of the temple or the tabernacle within the temple, and also contained the Ten Commandments. The other goat was used as a scapegoat. You might have heard that phrase before. The priest would confess the sins over the goat and place it on them, physically put their hands on the scapegoat, confess the sins of the people, and then it would be cast out into the wilderness to symbolise the removal of sin from the people, away from God as well. So the focus on the Day of Atonement is about cleansing, is about purification and forgiveness. And it's still yearly observed by the Jewish people with fasting, special services, prayers and celebration. And they also abstain from work and other traditions that they do as well. So we're coming to our last five minutes of this God Day. And I really want to hone it into the modern day now. Of course, Leviticus is a historical book as well. It's full of instructions that the Israelites followed back in the biblical times. And I mentioned how important it is for us to follow some of those because it will bless us. And it is God's instructions for godly living and moral living. But also Leviticus, like I say, is the basis of us being holy or, or the Israelites being holy. But as Christians, we are also called to be holy today in the modern day. It says uh, in, um, where are we? In Romans, not to be conformed to the patterns of this world. That's Romans 12, 2. So just like the Israelites were not to conform to the pagan practices of their day, we are encouraged or instructed not to conform to the worldly practices around us. We don't necessarily worship false idols in the way that they did. We might not have wooden or, or golden calves that we follow and worship and bow down to today but we do have other things in our life that we may worship. For example, in Leviticus 19.4, it says, Do not turn to idols or make metal gods for yourself. I am the Lord your God. And you know, when I read that, what came to my mind, a metal idol was my mobile phone. That is an idol in so many people's lives, and I'm talking about myself too. What we idolise is what we spend time on, what we reach for, what we trust in. And how much do we rely on our mobile phones today? How much time do we spend on our mobile phones or on social media or speaking to our friends rather than reading the word of God? Anything that comes before God is an idol. So even if that's all you got out of today's God day about Leviticus, that is something, a conviction that we can work on. But we are called to be holy, as it says in 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. So Peter here is even quoting Leviticus to emphasise the point that Jesus who has called us is holy and therefore as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, we are called to be holy too. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 also says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. So he has called us to be holy. How do we be holy? Let's have a look at the book of Leviticus. 
Let's have a look at the, the moral laws, I think, in chapters 18 to 20. It's probably the most applicable ones for us in the modern day today. It says so much about not lying, not stealing, loving thy neighbor, all these things that Jesus taught us to do, taught his disciples to do, taught his followers and want us to do, to live a godly life, to live a peaceful life in harmony with one another, to love one another. And so often we can take these scriptures out of context and to implement it into something that will benefit us. For example, the one about tattoos, I don't have time to talk about it in today's God Day. But so many people take that out of context to say, you can't have tattoos because it says it in Leviticus. The context of that is do not have, mark yourselves or cut yourselves for the dead. Because this is what the pagans did at the time. So if you're going to look at that, you need to look at the whole instructions in context and understand why it is that God was saying that to the people at the time. And there's so many more. I've run out of time today on this God day. There's so many more moral laws in there that we could talk about that are applicable today. For example, he talks about not going to mediums and spirits, but trusting in God, that God will turn his face away from anybody who trusts in them. In Leviticus 26, it says, I will set my face against anyone who turns to mediums and spiritualists to prostitute themselves by following them. And by the word prostitute, he means people who will come to God when it's right for them, but then go to other idols and then come back to God and then go back to other idols. We need to put our faith and trust in God. Nothing else in this world. He created you. He loves you. He knows the end from the beginning. And everything in the Bible is to teach us, to also rebuke and correct us and to help us become the people that God created us to be. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be set apart. He wants you to be different from this world. You are a child of God and we encourage to act like it, to think like it and to shine the light to other people. Jesus is the light of the world and as his followers, we are to reflect that light into those around us. We are called to be holy and set apart. So I really hope this God Day has helped you get an understanding and overview of Leviticus and to encourage you to read it for yourself. God bless you and I will see you soon.